Mr. Jerry, a young but promising lawyer at a major firm, was not traveling to the province for business. He hadn't seen his mom in five years. And he had only been home in the village twice in the last ten years. There was no time. He was caught up in the capital with his demanding job, new acquaintances, friends, and romantic relationships. He wouldn't have even remembered that he hadn't seen his mother in a long time if she hadn't called him before his upcoming vacation. So you would at least come home. We haven't seen each other in five years. I miss you. Five years? Wow. Sure, Mom, I have a vacation coming up soon. I'll come and stay for a week. Jerry loved his mom, felt sorry for her living alone in the village. Many times he invited her to come to the city with him. He imagined how good they would be together, how she would always take care of her boy, how they would alleviate each other's loneliness. But Mrs. Clare steadfastly refused each time. No, Jerry, a man should stick to his roots. There's a reason why people say that. Think about it, what would I do there? I'd be bored in your city. You work all day, have other things to do. And I'll just become talkative, annoying, maybe even harmful out of idleness. But here I have my household, friends, girlfriends. I know everyone, everyone knows me. My graves are here. Whom will I leave them to? And, dear, it's time for you to get married, not drag me away from my place. Get married? Where will I find someone like you? And I don't want anyone else. You also say that you should marry a wife like your mother. Then you'll get married and forget about me. Yes, at 35, with a decent financial and social standing, Mr. Jerry was unmarried. There were women, and some of them would be happy to wear the coveted ring on his finger. He himself understood that it was time, but... And it was probably not because none of the urban acquaintances resembled his mom. Jerry never forgot his first, perhaps the most real love of his life, Molly. He stubbornly searched for her traits in other women, and sometimes it seemed that he found them. But each time, similar eyes, hair, or voice were devalued by the dissimilarity of everything else. And the dissimilarity was all the more insurmountable the more the new lover's traits resembled the beloved one. And by the way, Molly lived in the same village as his mom. Jerry had a romance with her. A long time ago, in his youth. Then he promised to come back. And now he was returning after ten years. The last time he was home was five years ago, at his father's funeral. And then he didn't see Molly. There was no time. And he himself was struck by the untimely death of his beloved father, a healthy, not yet old man who wasn't even sixty. And he couldn't leave his mother. It was scary. What about her? He stayed in the village until the ninth day, saw that Mrs. Clare had come to her senses a little, and left back to his new life, which also couldn't be abandoned. Then why did he leave his Molly, a girl whose memories woke neither greed nor regret in him, but only tenderness? She didn't understand this, perhaps, she was very offended by his departure. Understand, I can't stay, the whole future life depends on it, mine, and maybe yours, he told his beloved then. Don't cry, another year or two, and I'll come, take you with me. Where? What will I do there? How can I leave my parents? She said almost the same words that her now ex-mother-in-law refused him and offended him with these arguments. She wants him to stay in the village. In a big, rich place with good infrastructure. But what will he do there? Molly wants to ruin his future. But she doesn't want to give up anything herself. She refuses to go with him. She herself didn't go anywhere after school, didn't study anywhere, worked on the farm. And she wants to make him the same. And Jerry is capable of more. 
and he proved it with his entire life in the next ten years. And even before that, he worked for his future. Jerry graduated from school with honors, although he didn't receive a medal. Therefore, he didn't rush straight to college. Instead, he enrolled in a law college, graduated, and started working at a legal consultancy, earning experience for further studies. And he loved Molly. She was three years younger. By the time of their romance, she had also finished school but didn't pursue further education. She wasn't a strong student, and things weren't smooth at home. Her father drank, her mother single-handedly maintained their sizable household, and Molly, the oldest of five children, had to help her. They lived at opposite ends of their large village and didn't see each other often. Only at 25 did Jerry see 17-year-old Molly and fell in love with her at first sight. He didn't confess right away. It wasn't because he was afraid or felt unworthy. On the contrary, he was already a lawyer, capable, talented, and successful with girls. And Molly was just an ordinary girl, not even 22 yet, barely thinking about her future. But when this girl passed by a long dead stump, it seemed that flowers were blooming on it. Every day that Jerry saw Molly turned into the most wonderful, full of incredible adventures, even if nothing happened. So their personal acquaintance didn't happen right away. And the day he finally decided to approach the girl was memorable for a lifetime. Chance helped. Jerry was going to the store and saw that the handle of the tightly packed bag of the girl who had just left had torn. He helped her gather her purchases into his bag and escorted her home. Molly later said that she almost fainted when he approached her and said, I'll help you now. Thus began their short but beautiful and tender romance. Short because Jerry had to leave for Washington to enroll in university. I have to go, my dear, but I will definitely come back very soon and take you with me. It's better to stay. How will I go? I have my mom, brothers, sisters. And here he was returning. Jerry loved traveling by train. It was time for contemplation without being distracted by driving. The train is moving and he has nothing to do with it. He first thought about his mom, how happy she would be at her son's arrival, how she would set the table, treat him, ask questions. Tell about herself. Then thoughts of Molly came. He hadn't seen his first love since he left. Why? Just because city life undermines even such bonds. He lived in a dormitory, studied, worked, had other interests, amusements, problems, and difficulties. It's so understandable, isn't it? He hadn't seen his mother for five years either. No, his mother did visit, of course. Mrs. Clare imagined her son's life in Washington as difficult, hungry, full of deprivation. So it's not surprising that from time to time she would come with bags of homemade preserves, pickles, jams, chickens and geese, raw and smoked. It was a feast for the entire dormitory. The students were always hungry, after all. His mother knew about her son's romance with a certain Molly, but she didn't attach much importance to it and never mentioned the girl. And he didn't ask. Sure, they could correspond, call each other, but this virtual connection quickly broke off. He didn't respond to her latest letter, didn't call back, and she didn't insist. And then what? Then she felt awkward bothering him, reminding him of herself. They weren't children, after all. Molly must have been married long ago. Following in her mother's footsteps. Her husband drinks, she gives birth every year. And it's probably for the best that they won't meet. What? She'll look dull and say, oh, yes, I remember. Well, I'll go then. I have a stylish cow. The youngest is teething. No time. Or worse. She'll be delighted. Come alive. 
Oh, look at you, so impressive, one word, a Muscovite. You're doing something with the laws there, a lawyer, right? Oh, it's good I met you. Help me write a complaint properly. I'm having a quarrel with my neighbor. She grabbed a piece of my plot and even put an outhouse right in front of my porch. All out of spite for me. Mr. Jerry smiled at his thoughts and closed his eyes. Here he was at the station, just a stone's throw away from the village and then to his childhood home. They made a good road, so it's easy to get there now, and they've improved the station, which used to be small and dirty. His gaze caught a large colorful poster depicting a beautiful woman. Molly? Yes. It was her, no longer that lovely girl, but a beautiful grown woman, an artist. He approached closer, carefully examining the poster. Yes, it's her, Molly. There's no wedding ring on the right hand holding the microphone. Not married? He read the announcement. Every evening at the cafe restaurant Northern Lights, the live music and performance of our local girl, singer Molly. So that's how it is. Molly has become not a domestic bird, but a star. Okay, we'll clarify later. He decided. Interested? Someone asked. Jerry turned around. A young man and woman were looking at him and at the poster. Our celebrity is local, sings at the restaurant. Are you a newcomer? Make sure to visit. Her voice is incomparable. She sings romances and pop songs. Everything. At our wedding, her performance was just. The woman chimed in. What do those other stars have on her? They just lip sync. Either they're old or, on the contrary, young and voiceless. But our Molly is like a nightingale. You must visit, otherwise you'll miss out. Thanks, we definitely will. And she's so beautiful. Jerry smiled, took a photo of the poster on his phone, and headed home. His arrival was supposed to be a surprise for his mother. Jerry hadn't mentioned the time of his arrival. On the contrary, he promised to come later. My boy. His mother exclaimed as she rushed to Jerry. What a joy. Why did you come without warning? I haven't prepared anything. What will I feed you with? I would have baked a pie and made something else. But now? Mommy, my dear, I know you always have something up your sleeve. I won't have time to look around before the table is overflowing. When has anyone ever left your table hungry? Let's stop talking about food for now and talk about you. How have you been? How's your health? You look wonderful, I can see. Everything is fine, my dear, let me admire you. You're like a famous artist now, so distinguished. I'm so happy for you. Mrs. Clare wiped away her tears. Oh, stop it, Mom. You're greeting me as if I'm returning from a war. It's been five years since you've been back. But you came. We've seen each other twice during that time. And now let me treat you a little. Do you think I don't miss you? Oh, I know, son. There's never enough time. You know... I'm so happy, so proud that you got an education. You've become a man. You live well. You live in Washington, of all places. And you're not a nobody there. All the women envy me. What about their children? Who do they have left here? So few people live well. And even if they've left, then what? Look at Mason, your classmate. He's also in Washington. But what's the point? He's doing some random jobs. Well, he earns something. But it's barely enough. He hardly sees his family. And you're doing just fine. And how much do you send me? Oh, come on, Mom. What am I sending there? 
What? Not everyone here is as well off as you. I've put a new roof on, installed gas and water, put in new windows. And there's still some left over. I'm saving up. I'll renovate soon. It'll be just as good as a city apartment. Mother quickly set the table, hastily, but everything was so delicious, so familiar, with such love. I haven't eaten this well in ages. Of course, who will cook for you there? Have you thought about getting married? You're at that age. What's it like living alone? And I'd love to see my grandchildren. I'm not planning to get married yet, Mom. But what can I say? I'll manage. You're better off telling me. Remember Molly? I used to date her. And today at the station, I saw a poster. He showed his mother the photo. Is she making a career as an artist? Oh, that's her. Yes, son, she's a singer now. I don't know much about it, but everyone praises her. I'm not a regular at restaurants, you know. But she was also on the local radio. Yes, she sings with soul. A beautiful voice. She sang some romance. Oh, your eyes lit up. Do you want to meet her again? Well, why not? Not like that, Mom. We'll just meet, talk. Is she married, do you know? I hardly know anyone from that area. I don't go there, I don't see her. She doesn't have children, that's for sure. So maybe she's not married. But you also think about whether you need such an artist. She'll latch onto you, that's for sure. But she's not young anymore. She has no education, nothing. And she's not a big time artist. But she sings in a restaurant. What a joy. What kind of wife will she be for someone like you? Oh, Mom, you're already arranging our marriage. I just asked. I'm not planning to actively seek out meetings with her. I was just surprised to see her in the artist role. That's all. I was afraid back then, ten years ago, that you would marry her out of foolishness. What good would she be? No education, barely finished school, then she dug in her garden at home. I would be ashamed to have such a wife, even if she were a singer. She sings here and in Washington. Who needs her, she'll sing with her singing. So watch out, don't mess things up. Jerry didn't intend to break anything, neither logs nor comedies. But he desperately wanted to see Molly. He couldn't answer the question himself if he still loved her. But the fact that she remained the main memory, the main obstacle to forming any kind of lasting relationship for ten years, meant something. Maybe she remembers him too. Maybe she harbors resentment. He needed to meet her. Maybe apologize. Or maybe just see her and understand that he did the right thing once. He walked into a small restaurant in the evening, just as the program with live music and the performance of their local celebrity singer Molly was supposed to begin. It was the Northern Lights. He remembered it as a simple cafe. Ten years ago, he used to come here with friends. And sometimes with Molly. Since then, everything had changed beyond recognition. The premises had been expanded, decorated. It was a real restaurant now, where people had started to gather. Jerry chose a spot in a corner, away from the stage where the performance would take place. Molly, when she comes out, probably wouldn't notice a lone visitor. But he would see everything perfectly. At a table in the middle of the hall, people seemed to be celebrating some event. Most likely, the singer's attention would be drawn to them. And here she came. Jerry had seen Molly on the poster and was already struck by the beauty of his former lover. But now she impressed him even more. He remembered her as beautiful, very sweet, but shy, even insecure girl. Now she was a magnificent, confident, 
self-assured woman. Tall, slender, in a beautiful dark blue concert dress with a carefully crafted hairstyle and makeup. She was a true artist and her voice was unique. The fact that she apparently didn't study vocal anywhere added even more charm to Molly's singing. What a fool I was not to come for her right away. Two years after starting college. Yes, she wouldn't sing in a restaurant, but she could have gone to study. And she would be a famous singer now. Or I would have stayed. Working as a consultant or a notary. And she would have sung. But what's the point of saying now? My train has left. I'll never catch up with it. Married or not, but she's clearly not alone. People at the tables responded to every song with applause and enthusiastic shouts. Someone shouted, Emerald. Hey, Molly, sing Emerald, I beg you, Emerald. Molly smiled, nodded to the musicians, and sang an old romance, unaware that she was breaking the heart of a lonely visitor. She's singing about herself, about us, about my betrayal. Jerry thought, It's beyond my ability to endure these agonizing sufferings. Let time and separation weaken them, so that they shine in the bright gold of my memories forever. Molly sang, and Jerry became increasingly aware that the main charm of her songs was not just in her voice, but in the fact that Molly sang from the heart, expressing her pain in her songs. Am I really to blame? Has she still not been able to forget what was between us? But then the evening ended. Molly bowed, took the bouquet handed to her. Jerry approached the stage and said, Hello, Molly. Jerry? The woman recognized him immediately. For the first second, there was not joy but fear in her eyes, but she quickly regained her composure. Hello, didn't expect to see you. I came. Heard you're a celebrity now. Came to listen. Magnificent. Never knew you could sing like that. Ten years ago, I didn't know either, Molly smiled. Would you mind sitting with me, talking? No, of course, let's sit. Wait, let me change and come out. She came out 15 minutes later, no longer dressed theatrically, but in light pants and a blouse. And most importantly, she seemed to have composed herself to look at the situation differently, that is, to gather herself before, perhaps, an unpleasant conversation. So, I'm ready. What did you want to talk about, Jerry? Molly asked almost cheerfully. I listened to your singing. It was magnificent. Smiling, she continued, you've already said that, and I hear it a hundred times every day. If you're done. No, Molly, I just don't know where to start and what to say exactly. Please don't leave. Will you forgive me for leaving back then and disappearing? Stop it, Jerry, you didn't disappear anywhere. And I, as you can see, neither. So why ask for forgiveness? Everything's fine for both of us. So, perhaps, it was all for the best. Yes, I cried once because of our separation. But if I couldn't live without you, I would have run to Washington. But I stayed. And I don't regret it much. Because dwelling on the past, the time hasn't come for that. When we meet again, in 30 years, then it will be time. But for now, it's too early for us to live on memories, whatever they may be, Molly sang. I remembered you all these years. Constantly. But, I think, these memories didn't hinder you from living? Did they help? Jerry felt that the conversation was not going as planned. Molly was already getting tired of his outpourings, but he didn't know what else to say, how to steer the conversation in the right direction. You're not in a hurry anywhere, are you? Someone's waiting for you? I'm not married, and I don't have children, if that's what you mean. I still live with my mom. She's waiting, of course, Molly said dryly. 
Then let me escort you. Or we can take a walk around. I haven't been here for a long time. I promise not to dwell on the topic of remember this, remember that. Now that's a different conversation. I love taking walks. It's a wonderful way to relax. Much better than sitting at home, Molly said. The walk turned out to be wonderful indeed, although it was impossible to do without memories. But it turned out that the memories of both of them were rather joyful because their shared time was their youth, and everything was so magical, so promising, something came true, something didn't, something turned out completely differently, for example, both are single. How did it happen? How can everything be fixed? And can it be fixed? After all, they are not old enough to live only on memories, but not young enough to live only on dreams and hopes. Unnoticed, they reached Jerry's house during their conversation. He offered Molly to come in. His mother greeted them warmly, although Jerry noticed her disapproving look. However, Mrs. Clare didn't say anything out loud. She seated her son and the guest at the table, prepared them a late dinner, talked to the girl herself, told something. Jerry went to escort Molly home, and upon returning, he said, You know, Mom, I love her. Yes, I see. But do you love her? Or is it just infatuation? I fell in love a long time ago. Then it smoldered, smoldered, and she blew on it, and it flared up again. Do you think if I propose to Molly, she'll say yes? And why not? After all, she loves you, it's obvious. I won't try to dissuade you. Get married and live your life. Both of you aren't so young anymore. Soon it'll be too late for children. And what's life without them? Jerry kissed his mom and went to bed. But he couldn't fall asleep for a long time. He didn't hesitate about the decision he made. He will propose to Molly, and he wasn't really thinking about the possibility of her refusing. He was just thinking about how wonderful the evening was, how much he loved Molly, and that life without this woman would no longer be joyful. Molly couldn't fall asleep either. She spent the whole evening trying not to show her agitation, struggling with her feelings. Now, alone with herself, she could finally relax. All those feelings that engulfed her many years ago and seemed forgotten suddenly woke up. Resentment, bitterness, the heartache after their separation, all forgotten. All the time they spent together. She never once thought about her feelings during that time, but now, alone, they all came back to her. Because she loved Jerry so much, even before they met for real. Even their names seemed to promise future happiness. They, Jerry and Molly, would be together. And so it happened. They were together for a whole year. And then he started talking about the need to leave. Would she not go with him, not to Washington, but even to the ends of the earth, to a polar station, to the desert? But family. Mom, dad, two sisters, and two brothers. How could she leave them? And in such a complicated situation. Her father started drinking more and more. He would get aggressive when drunk, and only she, the eldest daughter, could calm him down in those moments. It's not that he was afraid of her or particularly respected her, but rather he felt guilty towards Molly. When Molly was five, he came home drunk, started fooling around, and the girl got so scared that she lost her ability to speak. Her mother took her to all sorts of doctors. Molly didn't speak for two years. She heard everything, understood everything, but couldn't speak. She was about to start school soon. They were planning to enroll her in a school for children with disabilities. Every day, her mother cursed her father. He ruined his daughter's life. Who was she now? Just a colleague. Only in the summer, before school, her mother was hanging out the laundry. Molly was sitting at home with the kids. 
and then she suddenly rushed out of the house. She was screaming, Mom, Peter fell. He's bleeding. Her mother just sat there. That's what you get, a cripple. Peter turned out to be fine. He just fell and split his lip. Nothing serious. But Molly started talking. They enrolled her in a regular school. Everything was fine. But her father didn't forget his guilt towards his daughter. Or maybe he was afraid she would lose her ability to speak again. No matter how drunk he was, as soon as he saw Molly, he would calm down and go to sleep. He didn't stop drinking, though. It was all on the mother. And on Molly, as the eldest. And how could she leave everyone? And it was scary. What would she do in Washington? Even if Jerry doesn't deceive her, he will marry. But he's a student, living in a dorm. No money. What kind of wife does he need? She decided to wait two years, then we'll see. But she realized that her beloved had forgotten her. Of course, she cried. What else could she do? And then her father died, and they were left even without his, albeit small, income. And the younger ones are growing up. Her mother is getting sick. Life is getting harder. Molly had to look for a job, but she had no education, no experience, no work history. So she had to settle for being a dishwasher in a cafe. The salary was meager, of course, but there were groceries nearby, in case anything was left over. Not leftovers, but scraps, as they say. So she worked, washed dishes, floors, and sang. Molly always loved singing but she was shy, although she knew she sang well. Well, why not sing at home? But in front of strangers, she wouldn't dare. One late evening, just before closing, as she was washing the dishes, she thought she was alone and sang out loud. She memorized the songs and the melody and the lyrics just flew out of her. And it wasn't a new song. She had heard it many times. She sang. Drop all your affairs, I'm waiting for you tonight. It was a beautiful song, albeit a sad one. Molly thought no one could hear her. But it turned out the manager did. He came out and listened. And when she finished, he applauded. Listen, Molly, what are you doing here washing dishes with such a voice? You're a ready-made singer. Come on, quit all this and come out tomorrow onto the stage. Sing for the guests. Are you serious? Molly was embarrassed. I don't have any education. And who's going to ask you that? I'm not inviting you to the conservatory. Sing here. We have a piano just sitting there, rusting away. And my wife plays well. We'll find someone else too. There's an accordion, a violin. Don't blush, you'll knock the crowd out, you know how it goes. So, no dishes tomorrow, come ready as an artist. Wear a prettier dress, that blue one of yours, do your hair, and all that jazz. And Molly wasn't really that shy anymore, so she decided to do it. They discussed the repertoire with the administrator's wife and rehearsed a bit in the morning. And in the evening, she gave such a concert that there wasn't enough food the next day. People flocked to listen to her. The income became, of course, not dishwashing-like, you can't deny that. Although Molly wasn't particularly interested in money. She enjoyed singing. And that's how she became an artist. But I wonder, would Jerry come to see me if I remained a kitchen cleaner? Thought Molly and fell asleep. The next day, she asked her mother, Mom, what if I suddenly leave? How will you manage without me? Manage what? We won't be able to sing, that's for sure. And what else? Your father is gone, there is no one to calm down. Of the children, only Jessica will remain. So she'll get married and the house will be empty. 
but her groom is homeless. How far are you planning to go? Oh, I don't know yet, Molly evasively replied, while thinking to herself, no one is inviting me anywhere yet. But her mother was already dreaming. To the city, perhaps? It's a bit late for studying. But you sing so well. Maybe they'll take you somewhere, on the radio, on TV. If they call, go, what's there to think about? I've already tortured myself enough thinking that you ended up without education, without anything because of us. Okay, go sing now. And what if something goes wrong? Then it's back to washing dishes or twisting cow tails? You're right, Mom, you're right. But no one is inviting me anywhere, not to any radio station, Molly thought. They met with Jerry every day, and in the evenings, he would meet her after her performances. They walked all the paths they used to walk in their youth, remembered all the memorable places, all the words they once said to each other. And after a week, it was time to hear the ones that once broke hearts. I'll have to leave soon, Molly, and I can't stay. Work. I understand, Molly sighed lightly. Well, what can you do? Maybe we'll meet again in ten years. I don't want to leave you for ten years or even ten minutes. Come with me, Molly. Now I'm no longer a student, I have something to offer. What role will I play? What role will I have in that Washington? So I'm telling you, I'm offering you my hand and heart, you'll be my wife. Aren't you agreeing? I'm telling the truth, I can't live without you. I need to think about it. I'm not a little girl anymore to just run off like that without looking back. I'm sorry, Jerry, but I can't do it just like that. All right, I've already bought two tickets. Here's yours. I'll be waiting at the station tomorrow evening. Let's go together, okay? But I'm begging you, Molly, I can't leave without you. I don't know when I'll be able to come again. Okay, let's do it like this. I'll either come or I won't. I don't even know myself, you understand? There's too much to think about. Indeed, there was much to think about. In the evening, she hinted to her mother again about the possible departure. But this time her mother guessed. Are we dealing with this fine fellow now? Well, think about it, of course. He's a prominent guy. But how will it be for you? Claire will be boasting about her son, and everyone will be envious. And he's a scientist, almost the first person in his Washington. The first friend to all the ministers. Lots of money, and he picks brides as if under a microscope. Oh, how could you not please him? Ten years ago, he left without a second thought. Did you think I didn't hear you crying all night long? I was afraid you'd lose your voice again. The younger sister chimed in. Come on, Molly, go ahead and go. Even if he leaves you, it won't be on the first day, and by then, you'll have settled in somehow. You're quite the advisor, aren't you? Just be quiet already, the mother waved off. Well, yes, they say it's not good to stay in one place, she added. Molly went to her room, lost in thought. Yes, she wanted to go with Jerry. She loved him. But was her mother right? After all, he abandoned his Molly ten years ago. He remembered, remembered, but not once did he show up, not once did he write a heartfelt letter. And when her father came to bury him, he didn't even take a step towards her. And now he came, saw that she was fine, and decided that Molly would come running, abandoning everything. Such determination, he even bought a ticket already. Sure, Molly started packing her things, then thought about tearing up the ticket, then cried, got angry at herself, at Jerry. But it wasn't even wounded pride that was the main reason for her hesitation. There were more important reasons. Okay, I'll go, Molly thought. 
and who will I be there? Suppose, the wife of a good, maybe even famous lawyer. But who knows, maybe he has a dozen such wives. Will they even want to yield to me? Okay, he'll be with me. But who am I? Here, I'm known, respected, loved. I sing, I bring joy to people. And there? I can only work as a cleaner or a dishwasher if they hire me. But neither I nor he will want that. So, living off my husband's income, if he becomes such. But in Washington, you can see a lot of interesting things. But what next? There were no answers to these questions. And leaving my own behind. Mom says they'll manage without me here. And they will, but how? Jessica's fiancé is incomprehensible. Mom is getting older. The household doesn't bring in any income. Mine won't either. She imagined her mom, already old, trembling with cold on the road over the cucumber barrels that nobody wants to buy. No, I won't go. Let him do as he wants. I should have thought earlier. Let's see how he reacts to this. But what is there to see? He'll come back in another ten years with his I love you so much. Molly pushed the half-packed suitcase away. She threw the ticket on the table. Jerry, too, was getting ready to leave, not in the best mood. One thing was on his mind. Will she come or not? And what to do if she doesn't? I can't stay, there's work, but leaving without her is unthinkable. The mother bustled around, getting her son ready to leave. Look, there are preserves here, your favorite jam. I'll wrap it with this scarf, another soft one, so it won't break. And here's something for you to eat on the road. Look, this is the chicken coop, eat it first. And the sweet buns can wait. Oh, Mom, I won't be on the road for a year. And where should I take all this? Back home, of course. Are you going alone, or are you taking Molly with you? I don't know, Mom, if she'll go. I gave her the ticket and told her when to come to the train. Oh, fiancé, oh, cavalier, who invites girls like this? No wonder you're still single. What if she gets offended and doesn't come? You should have gone together, as a couple, but now what? In front of the whole village, the girl runs off with a suitcase. Well, Mom, you seem to be against her anyway. When was I against it? Maybe back then, long ago. But what about now? Now you're in a dependent position. A woman can live alone, but heaven forbid a man ages alone. Oh well, I'm aging right along with you. What do you want? Your peers' kids are already engaged or married. And anyway, if you're going to get married, why not marry Molly? At least she's your own. But there in Washington, you'll find someone of your own, and I won't see her. But with Molly, at least you'll visit more often. The mother sat down on the couch and cried helplessly. My dear mom, come on, I'll come back, with Molly or alone. I promise, I'll visit more often now. Did you put the pies with cabbage? He hastened to change the subject, and his mother, wiping away tears, busied herself again. Jerry arrived at the station half an hour before the train's departure. Molly wasn't there, neither on the platform. It's okay, there's still time. He nervously reassured himself. But his mother was right. It's not right to call like that. But what if she doesn't come? He didn't know where his beloved should appear from and was afraid to leave the luggage unattended, so he had to keep turning his head back and forth. It was getting dark. Jerry kept thinking he saw Molly rushing, but boarding was already announced. And she never showed up. Entering the carriage, he pressed against the dark window, staring at the emptying platform. The train rattled, started moving, gaining speed. 
If only he could see Molly running now. He could still jump out without any risk, hug her, and, if he couldn't drag her into the carriage, stay here with her. But no, Molly didn't come. The light from the carriage windows slid first over some garages, fences, then over trees. Well, that's it. Or not everything. I'll get off at the next station and come back. And let this job, Washington, and everything else go. He thought, stepping into the corridor and pressing his forehead against the cold glass. The vestibule door opened. He turned around in annoyance, frozen with joy. Blushing, Molly entered the carriage, dragging a small suitcase. Molly, you still. Jerry exclaimed with incredible relief, rushing to his beloved. I'm sorry, I almost didn't make it. I jumped into the last carriage. I hesitated for a long time, but I couldn't not come. I imagined not seeing you for another ten years. I would have got off at the next station. If you want, we can get off together. Stay there. I agree to everything. In these few minutes, I realized that the most important thing is to be with you. But no. Let's go, so let's go. And then, whatever happens, I don't care anymore. What I lose, what you lose. If something goes wrong, I can always come back. We'll return together. Hugging Molly, Jerry replied. From now on, everything will be together. We're not losing anything. We finally found each other. Embracing, their hands intertwined, they stood by the window, gazing into the darkness illuminated by rare lanterns. The future may have been unknown to them, but they knew they had done everything in their power to be happy.